Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Canadian Immigration Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Holthy, and I'm here with my guest host, Igor Kriliuk. How are you doing, Igor? I'm doing well, Mark. Thank you so much for hosting me on this podcast. Well, absolutely. We had to host you because you are the one that wrote this awesome little blog post in our Times Up series entitled, My Work Permit in Canada Expire Soon. Can I Change My Status to Visitor? So this is an issue that a lot of people um, are wrestling with. The circumstances when you may consider doing that, what are the consequences, what are their advantages, if any, what are the disadvantages? And so this is the third episode in our Time's Up series, all related to the crazy insanity that's going on in Canada right now. As we're uh, well aware, Igor, the Liberal government recently issued a series of very harsh measures to reduce the number of permanent residents and temporary residents in Canada. And uh, some of these measures are pretty harsh, aren't they? Yes, they are. And we will see not only reduction of temporary residents and permanent residents, we will see a lot of people who will be desperate trying to figure out what do they do now. Um, We already had a couple of consults with people literally not understanding what are their options. And we had to be honest with them and say, you don't have many options. Yeah, and that is a hard discussion to have. But that is one of the things as a firm, our integrity and the advice that we give sometimes is not going to be what people want to hear, but they need to hear it, especially if the options are virtually none. And the better option is to return back to their home country. We do not pull any punches and we tell people that so that they can actually make good decisions. And sometimes there will be a a reason or a rationale to transition to visitor status, and sometimes there won't be. And so the purpose of this particular episode is to help demystify that a little bit. But let's just set the, the stage. Now, if you haven't listened to series, the very first one, what to do when my work permit expires, or you know the, the challenges and why you don't wanna let yourself fall out of status and become illegal, which was number two in the series, um, let me give you just a little bit of an intro so that you can understand what's happened if you're just tuning in for the first time. So we know that just recently, the Minister uh, of Employment and uh, basically the Minister of Employment and Social Development Canada, ESDC, in an effort <clears throat> to reduce the number of temporary residents in Canada, including workers, instituted some new measures to reduce the number of LMIAs that are being issued to support these work permits under the temporary foreign worker program. So the first one happened on August the 26th. And that basically is where he instituted it. Um, if the and company has more than 10% and it's a low wage occupation. Um, and I won't get into all of those, but if it's a low wage occupation under the temporary foreign worker program, and there are more than 10% foreign workers on LMIA based work permits at that physical location, then the employer can't request more. Or alternatively, if there is a unemployment rate of 6% or higher, subject to some exceptions, and there are exceptions to these things, but generally speaking, if you're in a, um, they call it a, 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 they call it a uh, census metropolitan area, if w- within the applicable census metropolitan area, if you have an unemployment rate of 6% or higher, then they also can't apply for LMAs. So that was step one. Then on October the 21st, They basically took the cutoff between a high wage and a low wage position and said, okay, whatever it is in the provinces, let's say for Alberta, if it's $29 and change, well, for it to not be processed as a low wage position, the wage being offered actually has to be 20% higher than the median kind of that, that deciding cutoff wage. So for Alberta, it basically bumps it up to almost $35 or more. Um, And if you're paying anything less than 35 as the prevailing wage or the wage you're offering your employee, then you're going to be caught by this low wage restriction, which, like I said, more than 10% of your workforce foreign worker, it's a no-go. Or if you're in an area of 6% unemployment or higher, it's a no-go. So they anticipate by doing that, that there's going to be thousands and thousands of people that are no longer going to be able to extend their permit. So that's on the temporary side. And then we know just recently, the government also Um, on October the 24th, issued their long-awaited levels plans. And not just for permanent residents, but for temporary residents. So if we go down here and look at the news release, some of the highlights 
are that they are going to be reducing from 500,000 overall permanent residents down to 395,000 is the goal for 2025, and then reducing from 500, which was the previous projection for 2026. They're going to reduce it even further down to 380, and then they're going to see the target in 2027 go a little bit further yet down to 365,000 permanent residents. And so those the fact that those um, options for permanent residents are, are going to be reducing will have a significant impact on people. And like Igor said, people that are, are you know, what's going to happen? My work permit's expiring. You know, how do I change to a visitor status or should I even change to a visitor status? And then to take it a little bit further, their goal as well is to reduce the temporary population in Canada by 445,000 in 2025 and another 445,000 in 2026, which of course we know about the previous restrictions on international students and the numbers that they're going to allow in each year, coupled with the changes to the LMIA. And they're even making changes to the International Mobility Program for traditional work permits, such as the uh, C, I think 46, 47, the intercompany transfers used to be our old C12 for for non-US citizens and Mexico citizens. So these are citizens that are of all other countries. They're making it more difficult to get those. And um, and so this is kind of the world that we're in right now, Igor. And as a result of all of these changes, we are going to see a real pinch on people having the ability to transition to permanent residence, or in some cases, even extend their work permits. And I had a consult just today with someone who's working, uh, who has a rural renewal stream nomination from a community in Alberta. And they've submitted their permanent resident application through the PR portal, but they can't get a bridging open work permit until they get the acknowledgement of receipt. Well, the application was submitted in September. Their work permit, which is LMIA based, is going to be expiring in, I think, about March. But they're in an area, Igor, where the unemployment rate is 6%. And so the employer, unless they bump their wage, which is currently at $24, up to about $35 or more, they're not going to be able to um, extend their permit. Now, there's a faint hope that the PR portal will be um, processed and that, well, at least to the point where they will get that acknowledgement of receipt and then they can apply for a bridging work permit. But there's going to be many people in this situation who don't even have a PR application in the queue that are literally going to be facing the expiry of their work permit. So let's transition now to the actual world of visitors. And there's a lot of confusion about the difference between a visitor record and a temporary resident visa or a visitor visa. Maybe you can help to clarify that a little bit for the for the listeners. Yeah, so we had a couple of clients in the past who fell out of status because they did not understand the difference between the TRV and the visitor record. And um, to make things simple, a TRV is a travel document. So it's a sticker that you get in your passport and it allows you to appear at the border before the officer, and then the officer makes their own assessments to decide whether to let you into country or not. So having a valid temporary resident visa, the actual sticker in your passport, um, does not guarantee that you have status in Canada. So even if your temporary re resident visa is issued, let's say, until 2030, doesn't mean that you can remain in Canada until 2030. Every time you are admitted to Canada on a temporary resident uh, visa, you are by default admitted to, for six months. And if the officer wants to extend or limit your stay, then they would um, either put a stamp in your passport that limits your stay or would issue you the visitor record that extends your stay. And so here comes the difference between the TRV and a visitor record. So a visitor record is not a travel document but it's a document that um, gives you status in Canada. So um, if you end up in a situation where you need to extend your stay, it is very important that you don't apply for the TRV, but you apply for the visitor record. And it's very easy to make a mistake and um, submit a wrong kind of the application, even though they are exactly the same applications yeah. um, in essence. Um, the matter comes down to really what portal you use and um, how you answer some of the questions. You bet. So in summary, you guys, a TRV allows you to board the plane and travel to Canada. 
So it's your entry visa. It allows you to get on the plane if you're coming from a TRV required country. And one thing we don't talk a lot about is the uh, is the ETA. So some countries you are exempt from needing a TRV. An electronic travel authorization that you apply for it takes a couple minutes to get it authorizes you to be able to board the plane and travel. If you do not have one of those, either the TRV or the ETA, the airline is going to refuse to board you. So even if you have, as an example, a visitor record in your passport and you decide, hey, I'm going to leave Canada and I'm all good because I have my visitor record, which Igor has clarified is the document that indicates how long you can stay in Canada once you're there. That does not, it's not an entry visa. It's not a travel visa that does not authorize you to board a plane. So if you're coming from a country and you are leaving Canada, uh, well, you're leaving Canada to go back to your home country and it's a country that requires a visa, you will need to have a TRV to be able to get on the plane and return to Canada. So TRV, entry, visitor record, do documents how long you can stay. And Mark, right. maybe I can Let, also yeah. add here. Please. Um, you can actually use visitor record to cross the border, but in only very narrow uh, set of um, yeah. circumstances. Um, if you are traveling to a small archipelago, um, a set of islands, um, I think it's Miquelon. south of Newfoundland uh, or yeah. Prince Edward Island, whatever. Saint it, it's, yeah, Saint Pierre and Miquelon. So that is a French um, territory. Um, yeah. They have French flags. They have euros. Yeah. They they look European <laughs> yeah. in terms of um, how, how, how the restaurants are even designed. So, so culturally, yeah. that part of the world belongs to um, French, yeah. right? And so because it's located so close to Canada and because it's so dependent economically on Canada, they have a, a different set of rules for those people who live in St. Pierre and Miquelon or for those who travel to St. Pierre and Miquelon. And mm -hmm. another area of the world that is also covered by this what's so-called contiguous territory rule is mm -hmm. the United States. So you can have a short-term trip to the United States and then attempt to return back um, through the land, sea, or rail to the Canada having a visitor record. If yes. you want to fly into Canada, visitor record will not help you even if you travel to States or to St. Pierre and Miquelon. For air just, travel, it's only the TRV or an ETA. Right. And just to clarify, so this contiguous country, when you're admitted, this is where it applies most commonly. When you're admitted on your TRV, and the TRV is maybe a single entry, which is very rare these days, or it's expired, you can travel, like Igor said, down to the US or St. Pierre Miquelon and circle around, spend some time there, and drive back. But that is, a, if you're ever planning on doing that, we're just pointing out some of the legal possibilities. But don't listen to us. Don't just go and make any plans to travel because there are a whole list of other complications that potentially can be triggered. So we recommend you book a consult if you're ever planning on doing that. But just to lay out the legalities, yes, there are some circumstances where you can return to Canada um, when you do not have a valid TRV. But these are very exceptional cases like the contiguous country provision. And ultimately, when it comes to deciding whether or not to leave, um, make sure you seek legal advice on that. All right. So let's talk about the steps for applying for a visitor record. And remember, this is really what we're focusing on is all of you who are in Canada on a work permit that is expiring. And for whatever reason, you've made a determination that it's in your best interest to apply to extend your stay as a visitor because you don't have an option for a work permit. Igor, how do we do this? Take it away. Yeah, so the first thing is timing. Timing is the most important question. Um, it is extremely important that you submit your application before your work permit expires. And uh, though IRCC says on their website that you must apply at least 30 days before the expiry of your work permit, technically you can submit an application even on the last day. Um, and once you submit your application before your work permit expires, during the processing of this application, you will remain in maintained or implied status. And um, that is the most um, basic starting point, so timing. Second, you need to apply through a correct portal. Yes. So as we know, there's a myriad of different portals that RSC has created over the, the last couple of years 
we have the RSC secure account, we have the RSC portal, we have PR portal, PR landing portal, representative portal, and I can go on forever and ever. But it is important to point out that if you want to apply for a visitor record, you would be submitting your application through the RSC secure account. Um, I cannot help but uh, remind about one of the clients that we worked with maybe three or four months ago. Um, in that case, it was a citizen of Mexico, and she was remaining here in Canada, waiting for the acknowledgement of receipt on the spousal sponsorship application. But she also had to travel back and forth to Canada. At the same time, she also wanted to stay a little longer in Canada. And it coincided with the change of visa requirements for Mexican nationals. So in her situation, we needed to apply for the TRV and for the visitor record. And um, because we had to think strategically about how do we submit those two applications essentially at the same time, um, it was important to identify, okay, so for the visitor record, we would submit an application through the RCC secure account. And for the TRV, we'll submit an application through the RCC portal. If we were to submit the first TRV application through the RCC secure account, then we would not be able to submit a visitor record application through the RCC portal. So it's also important that you uh, think strategically. What exactly do you need? Do you need a TRV or just the visitor record? So that's the second consideration. And then third consideration is, again, you will have to think about the time that it takes to collect the documents, write the compelling letter of intent, and explain the officer that, yes, indeed, your status in Canada was worker. You want to transition to visitor, but you still will comply with the requirements of the um, with the RCC requirements and essentially leave Canada before the end of your authorized stay. Because you always want to put yourself in the shoes of the officer. Would you really be confident that the person would want to leave Canada after the end of their stay if they spent, let's say, three years in Canada as workers? How essential their ties to their country of origin? And the more time you spend in Canada, the more difficult it becomes to satisfy the officer that, yes, I'm just going to stay another six months and leave. And no, I'm not going to renew my visitor record um, for eternity. So there are a lot of things to keep in mind. Um, and uh, I think those are the three primary considerations, Mark, um, yeah. in terms of steps. Let's dig, Igor, a little bit deeper into this whole concept of, I intend to leave. I have temporary intent, um, even though I've been here. And in some cases, people could even have permanent resident applications in the queue and they don't have an ability to extend a work permit. And they're trying to maintain status long enough for the permanent resident application to be finalized. All of these factors play a role in an officer trying to determine if temporary intent actually exists. And we want to remind everyone that Canada does have the concept of dual intent. And so it is possible for someone to be seeking permanent residence in the long term, but still demonstrate an intention to remain in Canada temporarily. But when it comes to proving this temporary intent, some people just kind of gloss over it when they're already in Canada. And in fairness, the standard isn't as high for proving temporary intent when you're already here and you're extending a document or changing conditions on your temporary stay as it would be if you were applying for a TRV from outside of Canada. But with all of these changes that I've just talked about, with everything that the Liberal government has done and the mandates that they have pushed forward to reduce the number of temporary residents, guys, if you're on a work permit and it's expiring, you are the exact person that IRCC expects to leave. So when you are no longer have options for permanent residence and you're transitioning to a visitor status, you better really be clear in why you're doing that. And one of the most important components is proving your temporary intent. So Igor, how does someone do this? What do they focus on? Yeah. So recently we had, um, we had been working with two clients and um, they both submitted temporary resident visas applications. One of them actually submitted with the use of our firm, and then the other client applied with the, with the help of an immigration consultant. 
uh, they both uh, had their TRVs refused. Uh, they were outside Canada. And what we did, we assisted the clients to judicially review their refusals. So we had successfully settled both cases. They were reopened just to be refused again. And um, what I see happening right now is it looks like RCC has turned on the beast mode, refusing everything. And um, sometimes they just refuse the application because they reasonably conclude that, okay, I don't believe that this person will leave Canada. Sometimes they refuse it because, okay, I don't think the justification for this person to remain in Canada, let's say you're applying for a visitor record, is not sufficient. Like you don't have uh, family members who would require your presence in Canada and so on and so on. But sometimes the refusals are unreasonable and like they don't provide many explanation as to why they decided to refuse. Sometimes they do provide explanations, but the explanation is unreasonable. Um, in one of these two cases, the, the second application was refused because of socioeconomic and political uh, environment in the country yeah, of origin. Conditions in the country, yeah. Yeah, so, so um, and again, we're talking about the TRV application, so the context is a little bit different, but you can also apply it even to visitor record applications. So if the officer really does not believe you, or they, um, I don't know, maybe they did not invest as much time as needed into analyzing your application, or there is some any other um, element that would impact the decision-making process for the officer, like some bias towards the country where you're coming from, the officer can refuse. And it is the onus is always on the applicant to satisfy the officer that you will actually comply with the requirements. Mm -hmm. And there is no recipe for this, um, for this letter of intent, for this um, strategy that you will use with every application. So for some people, Maybe there is significant property ties to a country of origin. Maybe you left your family behind. Maybe your family has already departed and you just remain here in Canada to finish some of the affairs. Maybe um, you have any other religious or um, political or work um, affiliations that require your return back to your country of origin. Um, it's important with the visitor record applications, not only to show that, look, I have so many things that pull me back to my country, it's important to also demonstrate to the officer why you actually want to extend your stay here in Canada as well. So it's a second component, um, which probably makes this visitor record application a little more complicated because you have to look for in Canada uh, reasons to, for your stay and then ties that will still re re de yeah. demand your return. Back All home. factors that are going to return you back to you, make you want to return back to your home. And, and when you've worked here and you've, spent a lot of time, you've studied, you've worked, it can be a challenge. And this is like you said, Igor, we're seeing these really harsh decisions uh, at the overseas visa offices. But there is no way that we are not going to start seeing the same types of things in Canada. So one of the factors as well, Igor, that they look at is, okay, you want to stay for six months, but you don't have a job anymore. Mm -hmm. How are you going to support yourself financially? So mm -hmm. this is something that people absolutely have to focus on, right? Yeah, yeah. I actually, um, it reminded me about one of the consultations that I had um, about a month ago. Um, it wasn't directly related to visitor record, but it's still important as we talked about um, ability to financially sustain yourself in Canada. So in that particular scenario, a um, client who reached out for the consult was crossing the border and um, he was a truck driver and his work mm. permit got expired. Somehow he extended his status and then he decided uh, to get his work permit after the LMA was approved at the border. So he decided to flagpole, get the work permit at the border. And when he appeared before the officer, the officer obviously asked him, okay, so your work permit expired about three months ago. How did you sustain yourself in Canada financially mm -hmm. during this time? And his response was, I had my own savings. He's like, okay, can you show me your bank account? Um, so they looked at the savings account and apparently the client told that he had about 20,000 in savings when in reality he had only about 5,000. 
the officer got concerned with that. And then the client explained that all the money was borrowed to his friend. And this didn't, um, didn't sound right to the officer. Like if you're, like if you're he, out of well, job, I had 20, just to clarify. So what Igor is saying is I had 20,000, but I had to loan 15,000 to my friend. That's why there's yeah. only five in my account. Yeah. I always and so the officer was friend. obviously concerned. So you just lost your job three months ago. You have only 20,000 to live. You are in a very questionable legal status right now. Um, you cannot work. And then you lend 15,000 to your friend. So then they looked at a client's checking account just to see that he had ETF, not ETF, interact transfers yeah. every two weeks. And it was yeah. for about the same amount. Just his friend. Um, Paying him back. And the interact was coming from a business account of his friend. And so mm -hmm. when asked, the client responded, I think the client, uh, the, the transfers were coming from my friend and he was just repaying the loan. So mm -hmm. um, the officer didn't buy that. And the client was given 30 days to leave Canada. And it was too late for us to intervene and advise the client that, look, you first, you don't have, you, you must not work illegally. If your work mm -hmm. permit expires, and then yep. when you change your status to visitor, it's important that you comply with all conditions, that you are truthful, and that you understand that while you're waiting here in Canada for something um, in a visitor status, you cannot work, and um, there are some consequences that come with uh, yep. your decision not to be truthful with the officer. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, it's interesting, and I'll bring this up, it's not directly on this topic, but I want to remind everyone, the ports of entry are slowly closing off. So we're going to have future episodes within our times up as to what you can and can't do at the border. But the reality is when you get there, for sure, you're going to get a quick decision, but you may not like the decision that you get. So you need to be extremely well prepared with all the documentation, everything you need. But shifting back, Igor, to this whole concept of temporary intent and proving it. So we've got demonstrating your ties. We've got the importance of establishing that you have sufficient financial ability to support yourself while you're here and not having to work. But another key, key component is clearly establishing that you have a plan for departure. And, you know, any supporting documents that you might have or you know, sometimes people say, well, I've got a job that's going to be starting back home in four months or three months. And so I'm going to just take this last bit of time to enjoy Canada before I'm taking off. And I've got the money in my account. I've, I've got, like I said, I've got a place where I'm going to be return, returning to and where I'm going to live. Like those types of things are pretty easy. But for people that are actually thinking about sticking around and maybe they have a PR application, they're just waiting like, how would you advise someone in that circumstance, Igor, if they have a PR application in the queue? Let's say it's a CEC, where we know you don't have to necessarily remain in Canada for it to be processed, um, you know, as long as you don't have like a job offer associated with it or something that would require you to continue being employed. Um, well, how do you advise clients on this clear plans for departure when maybe they're waiting for PR? And yeah, I'm putting well, you on the spot here because this is a difficult concept. Yeah, we've, we've mentioned briefly the dual intent. Um, so that first thing that comes to mind, um, you can have a dual intent of staying in Canada temporarily and complying with your conditions and leaving Canada if needed, at the same time having the permanent residency obligation in process. Um, second, it's um, it, it, it is really hard to 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 advise exactly how do you prove that? Because again, the situation will be really case specific. Mm -hmm. For some people, the reasonable explanation would be, look, I've been working my tail off for the past three years. Now I want to travel. <laughs> I have this unique opportunity uh, where I don't have to work and um, I want to explore this country. Yeah. And um, I couldn't do it because I was on a closed, let's say, work permit and my employer would just not let me travel for three months. Um, yeah. Now that I've worked for three years, I've saved some money, now I can travel. Um, for some people, actually, Mark, it's um, also important to mention, and I'm sure you've talked about it in one of the previous episodes of the podcast. Um, 
for some people, it makes sense to actually leave Canada and continue working from abroad and waiting for the processing of their application from outside Canada. Um, and working for a Canadian employer from outside Canada counts as foreign work experience. Um, that's also important. Um, maybe your employer sends you off to work in a different branch somewhere outside Canada. Um, maybe that will be helpful. But again, if you plan to return from that um, business trip, you would need to have a valid TRV to cross the border. Yeah. And that's a good point. So I, I, what, one thing I want to point out here, I'm just flipping back to the YouTube channel. So one thing that Igor just mentioned in passing, and, and we've talked a little bit about this previously, I'm just going to see if I can find it. Um, let's see if I can find the actual video. Uh, Hmm. I'm not even sure if I can find it. We've got so many. Oh, here it is. Okay, I'm just going to share with the, the viewers here. So this one here, Express Entry 2024, surprising strategy to increase CRS, but why no? Why is no one talking about it? Essentially, I think is what it is. Yeah, talking about it. So this one right here is, is uh, like one of the things Igor pointed out. You may not have enough CRS points right now, and um, you may not have any foreign work experience. But I would recommend that, you know, as you're trying to figure out, do I stay? Do I extend my stay as a visitor? You know, I don't have an ITA yet. Do I consider going home? Well, in some cases, if you assess your CRS and just, just add in one year of foreign work experience, make sure to calculate for an, an age increase, like you'll have a birthday. But if you were to go back and work for one year, in some instances, you might just be surprised at how many extra CRS points you can get with that one year of foreign work experience. So I just point that out as a factor and just to expand on what Igor was, was talking about. So sometimes it's better to go home than even, even if you have a PR application, um, you know, an, like a, an express entry profile in the queue, sometimes it's better to go home and gain more Canadian work experience. And often, you know, it is when you've run out of options and essentially time's up. So yeah. Igor, when people are submitting these applications, often they do it as a last Thought. So right now, when you think about the processing times for, um, you know, for for a visitor record, let's just let's just pull it up here. I'll slide the screen over for those who are watching. So if you go to processing times, often what happens is people's work permits are expiring. They're trying to figure out what the options are to be able to stay, and in the end, they realize that you know their employer can't get an LMIA. There's no other option to extend their. Um, uh, their, their work permit in Canada. So if we look right now, the processing of a visitor record or a visitor extension, whatever it might be, is 120 days in Canada. So that's like 30, 60, 90, that's like over four months. And so often when people submit these applications, they are doing it um, at the very tail end of their work permit. So they're not getting a decision. So let's talk a little bit about the legal framework for what we call now is maintain status, which is this new term that was coined through the pandemic, number of different reasons. But for those of you old schoolers, it was basically implied status, which was built into the legislation. Why don't you just talk a little bit about this legal framework so people can understand what it means when you file the visitor extension? You know, are you still legal? Are, or, or, you know, how does it impact your status? Yeah, so it was previously known as implied status, but the term was a little confusing. And uh, again, I keep coming back to our previous clients because we had so many different um, uh, scenarios. One of our clients um, was in implied status because of the HNC application that we, he submitted. And I think he was trying to get his children enrolled into a kindergarten or he, he wanted to take a new car loan I don't recall exactly what was happening, but um, he came back to us asking for a letter confirming that he was in legal status uh, during specific, like a certain period of time. And we gave the letter um, and mentioned that, yes, this guy was in implied status and the clerk had no idea what are we talking about. Like, yeah. yes, we explained it in plain language, but like the terminology was really confusing. And I think maybe that resulted in the renaming of implied status into maintained status. So the concept is uh, pretty simple, but um, it can also be 
also confusing, right? So mm -hmm. um, when you submit an application while you're still in legal status, you extend your status until the decision is made on your application. And if, um, if you submit a renewal application of your existing status, let's say you have a work permit and you submit another work permit application, that means that you can continue working in between while the application is being processed. If you submit an application for the change of status, let's say from worker to visitor, it's important um, that you understand you cannot work because you essentially not extending your status as worker, you extend your status somewhere in between, like a worker and a visitor, like you don't have the worker uh, work permit anymore, a valid one, and you don't have the uh, visitor record at this time. So you can remain in Canada legally, but your rights to work will be limited. So you will not be able to work. And um, so similarly, like if you extend from study permit to visitor record, that doesn't mean that you, you can take another study program in between. Um, and if the processing time was not 120 days, but let's say 300 days, it doesn't mean that you can complete another decree while they process the application. Yeah. All right. Let's address, let's wrap it up here, Igor, by addressing some of the kind of common questions that people often ask. And uh, so one of the things, obviously, and you've kind of addressed it already, is the ability to continue working post work permit expiration with a visitor record application in process. So just to clarify, um, some people are under, uh, you know, this misconception that this implied status or maintain, maintained status allows them to continue working. But once that work permit expires and you, if you've applied for a visitor record extension or change of conditions to a visitor, um, that is the end date of your work. Like you are not to continue working. And so the thing that follows from that, Igor, is if someone transitions to a visitor status and then their employer is able to get a labor market impact assessment for them. There was a lot of confusion that was created through the pandemic because there were opportunities for people to apply inland and transition from a visitor in Canada to a worker uh, as a result of certain public policies that were in place. But the general rule, maybe you can just talk about that briefly when it comes to someone who transitions from a visitor record, can they apply for a new work permit from within Canada uh, through the in-Canada process if you've transitioned to a visitor and you have new visitor status? So since recently, no, you can't. So you must submit a work permit application from outside Canada if you are on a visitor status. There is actually a list of exceptions who can submit a work permit from inside Canada, but that would be um, if I'm not mistaken, the spouses of certain um, you workers in Canada. Status, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so there is a list and we can maybe even post a link to the list in yes. the description of the, under this video and in the podcast notes. Yeah. But as a rule of thumb, no, you must submit an application from outside Canada. And in part, this is why we've mentioned that for some people, it makes sense to move out and continue working for that employer who's waiting for the LMIA from outside Canada. If you cherish the relationship with the employer, if you have a clear pathway to career growth, maybe that is something that you want to consider. Because essentially, if you change it to change your status to visitor from inside Canada, do you get any benefits out of it other than you can continue remaining in Canada? Not many, right? But for some people, it still makes sense Let's say you have a, um, I don't know, maybe you starting a relationship with someone and um, you are waiting for the LMIA and maybe you are going through a treatment right now. Um, mm -hmm. And um, like maybe you are traveling, fulfilling your dream of your life. So, yeah. so there are so many different scenarios yeah. that can play out with, yeah. like this is life. Uh, life is unpredictable and yeah. it takes Un unexpected turns in um, everyone's life. So it's always important that you consider all options and don't exclude switching to visitor record because it doesn't allow you to work. It's just one of the, it's the tip of the iceberg. There are so many other reasons why people do that. 
Yes. Well, as we transition here to the close of our podcast, I do want to point out a couple resources that are available now on our Canadian Immigration Institute um, uh, platform. And so when you click on the link below, you'll see that one of the new videos, uh, new courses that we've created is a TRV course. Now, the topic of this is really extending visitor records, but a lot of the same principles involved in applying for a temporary resident visa also apply when it comes to temporary intent and you know financials and those kinds of things that really are going to come more into play than they ever have in the past. You know, prior to this massive reduction that the the Liberal government is pushing on temporary residents, I wouldn't be too fussed about applying for another you know visitor record if you're at the end of your work permit and you want to stick around for a little bit longer. I'll be honest, my whole history of practice, I never saw someone get refused as long as they completed everything and answered all the questions, usually they were willing to give people the benefit of the doubt to stay for another six months to wrap up their affairs or tour or travel or whatever before they headed home. But that has changed now. And I will never submit a visitor record for an individual to change conditions from a worker to a visitor without having a very comprehensive set of supporting documents to establish all of the things that we've talked about today. And uh, I'll also, you know, you can see here right now, uh, if you go in and you subscribe, you can learn more about the course when you uh, connect in and follow the link. And it has just a whole bunch of, there's over four hours of, of content available through a series of, uh, of videos and supporting documents and templates and lots of things. There's even a little, a little um, uh, custom GPT, I think, Igor, that you've set up to some extent to help people with uh, putting together some of the supporting documents. So this is definitely worth it. There's a there's because we just launched this, just released it. Those who are early uh, subscribers to it uh, for a limited time only, it's it's got it's over sixty six percent off. It's a hundred dollars right now, Canadian. So definitely slide in, take a look at it if you're looking at extended even within Canada because it's a tool that's available for you. And as always, Mark. remember that. Yeah, go ahead, Igor. Yeah. While you're sharing the screen, we can also mention that if you're not ready to commit for the whole course, we also offer the PDF letter of intent guide. Mm. So it does not include access to the custom GPT that we've developed, uh, but it will give you a list of questions that will guide you through the process of writing your own letter of intent. And again, it's important. Um, you will submit a very similar application regardless of whether you apply for the TRV or for the visitor records. You still need to prove the same things. But in addition with the visitor records, you need to prove why do you actually want to stay in Canada longer. So it maybe even complicates the application a little bit better, a little bit more. Um, but this letter of intent guide, um, I think it has like 13 bullet points um, mm. that, that walk you step by step. You will see the header. How do you address the letter to the officer? How do you explain your family ties, property ties, economic ties, financial like any any anything that you need to actually put into letters. So I will not even go through all of the bullet points. It's super helpful. And for those who are not native English speaker, sometimes it's hard to lay out your thoughts and writing on a piece of paper. And that's why we have this custom trained GPT. And if RSSE uses artificial intelligence, why can't yeah. applicants use it? And um, frame their thoughts a little bit better. We um, made it very clear in the GPT instructions that it does not hallucinate and create information for you. It does not put worth in your mouse and it works only with the information that you provide. So um, it, it is trained just to be your best assistant, best friend in outlining your ideas and thoughts mm -hmm. and, and uh, making a pitch to the officer. Yeah. And remember that that Igor spent quite a bit of time training up that custom GPT and, and remember that that is only available when you subscribe to the, the entire course. All right, that's great. Okay, so as we wrap things up, we we'll also want to point out that anytime anyone wants to uh, connect with us, like remember, go to our site, the blog post section right here is just chock full of content. So there's our Time's Up series. Every one of these videos has, to a large extent, a corresponding blog post associated with it. So if you haven't listened to the episode one, go back to the beginning, listen to the, the very uh, initial one times up, which is a very good overview of all the issues that people are dealing with. 
And then, uh, you know, how long can I stay in Canada after my work permit expires? And then, of course, can I change my status to a visitor? So stay tuned because we'll be the next one that we're going to be covering is directed at all you postgrad work permit holders and the issues that you specifically are facing. And uh, of all of the people most negatively impacted by these decisions, it is you by far. So I, we want to extend, uh, you know, for me, at least when I think about all of this, I just, it's just tremendous compassion. And, and I'm just so, you know, I'm so sad for all the people who've spent so much time. They have, you know, invested so much in having an opportunity to come to Canada and to transition to permanent residence. And the reality is many, many of you will not have an opportunity. So it becomes very, very important to get the right advice, to seek the guidance that you need, to get the support and help to strategically plan your future. And um, when you go to our website as well, remember that there's always the ability for you to book a consultation with us and we can help a develop a strategic plan for you to find whatever options that might be available to stay. Or at the very least, you can confirm in your mind that you have exhausted all your options and the best decision for you is to return back to your home country and keep all of your options available, which go back and listen to the previous podcast episode because we covered all of the issues and the dangers of staying without authorization uh, in, in great detail. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Igor, any last parting words before we wrap this one up? Yeah, just um, wishing everyone best of luck. You will need a lot of luck right now to navigate this world of Canadian immigration safely. Yeah. It's a crazy one. All right, guys, take care.